Hello, hello, hello. It is Wednesday. I hope you're someplace fun getting ready for the summer. It is time for making waves conversations with influencers and disruptors. Today's guest is both Professor Dr. Gair Grouse, OBE, who is the Global Director of Education at Kidzania, is live with us. It's midnight in the UK. And he was introduced to me a few months ago by a longtime Tedster and close friend, Lee Daly. So I want to thank Lee. And he is one of the smartest educators on the planet. And I tell you, after a few conversations, I really knew that to be true. And I couldn't wait to get him on the show here to talk with you and introduce you to my new friend, uh, Dr. Gare. Gare, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be with you and to see you again. I'm I'm so enchanted with your life dedication to education. I, uh, as as uh, our listeners know, I founded a computer animation company called Wavefront here in Santa Barbara 38 years ago. Uh, but we had lots of uh, uh, young people come through uh, the program and learn how to be animators and go on to create uh, great careers. And as a result of that, I got involved in the Partners in Education, where they had business leaders and educational leaders come together once a month to kind of understand the challenges of both of those different worlds. So I, I feel like I have a, a decent sense of it. But I think the thing that I love most about your approach is that education is through the kids having an experience doing a job in a, in a place that has real jobs which are these various locations of Kidzania. So that was a really long setup. You can pick up any thread in there you want. Thanks, Mark. I think, uh, I mean, experience is everything. And, and what seems to have happened over, over particularly most recent years is that we, we have a, an extraordinary focus on schooling. And, and I, would, I would quite deliberately distinguish between schooling and education. Schooling is the bit where, whereby governments decide what children should be taught at what age. They, they term this a national curriculum. Teachers are often told when to teach it and how to teach it. Children are tested and schools are inspected and league tables are produced. And, and effectively, you could have a whole conversation, a whole discussion about schooling without mentioning the word child once, because it's about content, it's about systems and structures and assessments. And, and it is no longer about experiences because I measure you against what you've been taught. When I, pre-pandemic, used to travel literally all over the world, I, I made a habit of asking children of all ages, tell me why you go to school. Mm. And the answer I got all too often was because I have to. I think there are better answers. And I think the answers become better the minute you connect this schooling and being taught bit to finding out why being taught some of those things is actually important, i.e. purpose. Now, you don't tell the children the purpose. You provide scenarios and environments within which they can find out for themselves. And, and every experience, incidentally, is a good experience. So even the experience that I don't like something, in the end, is a good experience because, you know what, I made up my own mind. And, and the thing I like best about Kidzania in particular is that once inside, uh, adults are there to be seen and not heard. And, and I think, <laughs> I that, I think that, that I think that is, a, a, is a very appropriate <laughs> thing when it comes to experience-based learning. Now, now, clearly, those experiences go for museums, to go for galleries, to go for, zar for, for, for parks, for zoos, for farms, you name it. This is not just the domain of, of a Kidzania. It is simply about enabling children to start to write the narrative of their own possible. Hmm. Do you feel that there's a, an ideal age? I noticed on the site it said kids from 1 to 14. Is there a kind of a sweet spot where you know 
boy, if I could get that child at this age, if they could have this experience at this age, it's going to fundamentally alter their life course. Uh, it's, a very, it's a really good question, uh, Mark, and, and I'll, I'll try and answer it in, in two ways, if I may. Firstly, I think many exp in the world we, we occupy, um, the here and now, I think the opportunity to experience certainly more and possibly better comes at a point where you become a confident reader. And a, conf and a confident numerate person. So possibly, let's just say at the age of seven, perhaps, because all of a sudden, and the same applies to yeah. Kidzania, pre, pre being a confident reader, um, you can't be the news reader. You, it is difficult to participate in, in the radio program activity, and, and, and. So I think that's one thing, but that is about the world we occupy. That doesn't make it right. But, but perhaps this is the point, Mark, where I could talk about some of the research that we've done and that begins to answer that question differently. So we... You, you know I love research data. So, I, I, this, <laughs> so please go on. But, but I think it's a slightly different set of data. As, as we will see, it's a slightly different set of data. I, I've always held the belief that one of the down sides of schooling is that in the end we don't know our children well enough after 12 14 15 years of statutory schooling the child is a number or a letter i.e a grade and 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 that's about it and i just don't think that's good enough. so at some point uh, some years ago six seven years ago i sat down with some uh, with some analysts in london and kind of said look we have Lots of data of children, of course, appropriately anonymized data of children who come to Kidzania because they, when they arrive, they, they wear a bracelet. That bracelet is so that we can track where they are in case of an emergency, for example. But of course, it also allows us to see which activities they choose. Mm. So, so my idea became, let's just look at a school visit, preferably their very first school visit to Kidzania, Let's see what the child's first choice is. So we took a, a, a massive sample of 61,000 in London, and then later we took a, across another eight countries, we took another nearly 600,000 children's data. Once we had that data, that choice data, I then wanted to know who are these children. Are they four? Are they 14? Are they boys? Are they girls? Are they rich? Are they poor? Are they urban? Are they rural? Can we determine their ethnicity within this? Which country are they from? And, 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 and. So we did that analysis. And, and initially in the UK, we did it against what is known as the government's index of multiple deprivation. And in other countries, we looked at the other appropriate government measures. And then we found the answers. And the answers were fourfold. The first one was, which is a very interesting observation, is, is that there was almost no difference between the different countries. So from Mexico yeah. to India, from India to Turkey, from Turkey to London, from London to Dubai, from Dubai to Moscow, uh, the, the differences were statistically insignificant. And, and I think we have to begin to ask ourselves something around the globalization of growing up. And, and we need to answer to ourselves whether that's a good thing. Beppa Pig in 24 languages and all shopping malls look the same. And are we losing our local identity? Where is the balance? What's good about it? What's not good about it? So that's the first finding. The second finding was that um, all stereotypes were set at the age of four. So you, you go into the aeroplane, which is a real aeroplane, and there are two activities. One is cabin crew. One is pilot, pilot, 95% boys, cabin crew, 90% girls. Self-selected. So it goes. Yeah. So from they, the they, age they of They self-selected that. Yeah. Yeah. From the age of four. Wow. Okay. It is, it is incredibly stuff. We suspect, Mark, that that's younger, but we only have the data from the age of four. Mm. Okay. And, and that runs throughout. Remember, each designer has about 60 activity 60 jobs if you wish and they all go with stereotype 
Okay, so that's from the age of four. Now, the second finding was that there is very little difference between the age of four and the age of 14, i.e. the upper age. And that's quite significant because governments all over the world invest lots of money into something called STEM, you know, the science, yeah, technology, sure. and mathematics yes. agenda. So in my discussions with politicians, I will mention these findings and the answers you typically get is, ah, but the girls are now outperforming boys in tests. And I'm, I'm kind of politely going, I think you're missing the point. Congratulations. If that's what you wanted to achieve, that's brilliant. But once the girls have outperformed the boys in tests and it comes to their career choices, they revert back to stereotype because you've never given them a role model. You've never given them anything to look at or to aspire to. Who do you want to be? So, so that's, a, that's a, a set of very stark findings. Now, as the father of two daughters, the next finding, um, almost all girls globally, regardless of their background, almost all girls choose activities below their age range. Nine-year-old girls choose seven-year-old activities. Nine-year-old boys choose nine, 10, or 11-year-old activities. And that, that I can only relate to to a lack of uh, self-confidence and perhaps a lack of self-esteem or being mollycoddled by parents or whatever it is. That thing about you go to a park and there is a climbing frame for toddlers, okay? And there are, there are sets of families there with 18 months old children. The minute the little girl goes near the climbing frame, all the parents go, be careful, be careful, don't hurt yourself. The minute the boy goes near the climbing frame, the parents go, come on, come on, what's taking you so long? Yeah. Why aren't you at the top yet? 16 years later, yeah, if this continues and those stereotypes are allowed to cement themselves, we know that we've got an issue. The, the final finding of the research was that the children can only aspire to what they know exists. Yeah. The children from socioeconomically disadvantaged areas who have as a cause almost fewer life experiences than more advantaged children, those children's choices are limited. So when they come to Kidzania, they will never choose the aeroplane, they will never choose the operating theater, they will never choose the television station or the radio station or the theater as their first choice. They will choose the supermarket, making beds in the hotel, cleaning windows, and being a courier because you choose within your comfort zone. You choose to what you know. Now, my, my thinking is if we gave more opportunities to experience to children from disadvantaged contexts, we might be onto something in terms of enabling and empowering those children to become confident learners. And we're starting, I have a, a, a professorship at the National Research University in Moscow, and we've just agreed to start a global piece of research on this, to make the link between the experiences, what is learned, and how that can improve the achievement and attainment in schools. So, so that's the research. So to go back to your question, Mark, I think at the age of four or younger uh, is when this needs to begin, because we also have something in our system then that says, so if the stereotypes are set at the age of four and possibly before, and we don't talk in our schooling system to our children and young people about their futures till they're 14, we allow this to cement for 10 years. Mm. And we honestly mm. still believe that we can change hearts and minds after that. I think that becomes very difficult. So, so in terms of at what age should experience-based learning begin, as young as possible. A lot, a lot to chew on there, Doctor. I want to remind our uh, listeners, if you have a question for Gare, just type it in the chat. and We will get to those in a few minutes. Gare, I'm... I'm curious who, 
So if adults are to see, be seen and not heard inside the confines of these fabulous facilities, we've posted all that in the show notes so people can go look and you've got videos and there's lots of great stuff. Um, how, how do you encourage the, let's try to break the gender stereotyping, just start there and say, you know, just have, or is there any leadership at all that could say, hey, let's, today it's girls day in the cockpit or today it's, you know, I mean, is, or are you just letting them is, do you mess with the data by giving them these opportunities? Like you said, they only know what they know. Well, they don't know, they, heck, I like, I, I've got great attention to detail. I've got great uh, eye motor skills. Put me in a cockpit. Um, do you, or does that skew? I mean, is that your role? <laughs> I, I <laughs> think, let it naturally well, I, I happen think, or skew? I think our role is um, to create a level playing field in terms of choice. That's what I think okay. our role is. So, okay. so, so if I start by saying, uh, perhaps rather crudely, but I think it makes the point, uh, at the end of the ride, I don't actually care what they choose. As long as ch all children are aware that all choices are there for them. So it's an, we need to lead to educated choices. And I think, Mark, uh, you, we can do two things. We can write very long academic papers about this and present them and get the politicians to talk about it. And then all these children are grown ups and are soon accessing their pensions, perhaps. I think, I think we can look at ourselves and think how we very pragmatically can make a difference. And I mentioned role models earlier. So, so let me tell you what we did, or what I did at Kidzania London in the early days. I'm going back to 2016 now. So, so you walk around and you watch the children and you know from the research what, what the story is. And I'll give you the example. At the time at Kidzania London, we had in partnership with Renault, we had a Formula E experience. Oh, so you yes. learned about, you learned about, electric engines and you and then the activity became you changed the tires on the formula oh, e car goodness right? oh my goodness so and we had two members of kidzania staff in the activity so so what i did is i observed for a number of days and literally sat at the bench outside and i observed that if i start the day off at 10 o'clock in the morning with two members of staff both male that no girls go in because what happens is the queue becomes boys, the girls walk past and they kind of think, well, that's not for me. And they walk past never to be seen again. So the experiment became this, between 10 and 12, we put two male members of staff in and, and the activity was 100% male. Between 12 and two, we put one male and one female member of staff in. And the, and the shift became 75, 25. Uh -huh. Then between two and four, we put two female members of staff in and the shift became 60-40. And you could see those wow. young girls walk past, see a female in an engineer's overall, and you could see them watch, watch a little longer and join the queue. Now, my point is this. It didn't cost the business a penny. All we needed to do was just move the road off some staff right. who were already on our books. But what you begin to do is you begin to use research, fact, good evidence, to then internally look and say, what can we do to try and make that better? And, we, you know, and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. Similarly, what we started to do, we started to organize careers weeks. So certain weeks we would go to our sponsors industry partners and say can we borrow some of your real stuff so that mm. i use the airplane as an example which in london is sponsored by british airways so 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 you you land the airplane on the flight simulator and hey presto behind you stands a a british airways pilot who says i'm off to acapulco in four hours is there anything you want to talk about before i fly and that becomes a very cool experience and right. a role model experience. So I deliberately at the time, many years ago, phoned British Airways and said, I'm looking for a black female pilot. Ah. And, and British Airways said, so are we. 
<laughs> and and there was a kind of an embarrassed an embarrassed giggle to go with that. And yeah, sure. and uh, you know and and I I can send you if I haven't already marked a little video where, which shows that British Airways now uses its Kidzania partnership to engage its female pilots mm. with young girls to oh. show them that they, that you can travel from inspiration to aspiration. And in that, in that sense, BA as a company moved from their Skidzania, what's my return on investment, to their Skidzania, what's my return on my involvement. And, 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 in, and in many cases, that's, of course, it's a long game, right? You don't get immediate returns. It's generational. Yeah. But, but, but if we want change, then sometimes we have to think that it is, it is beyond the lifespan of an election or a parliament or a president or whatever it is, because we tend to live these days, don't we, yeah, in four-year blocks or five-year yeah. blocks, wherever you live in the world. Well, actually, some of this is going to take a little longer. And, and maybe we, as, as, as organizations, as businesses, uh, need to take the initiative. And, and lead from the front rather than sit on the fence and complain that the youngsters who come to us aren't skilled enough. Well, come on, come off that fence, roll up your sleeve, come and give us a hand. One of the things that I, I'm curious about is you said there's a couple of hundred jobs at each one of the locations. And the kids, I'm guessing they wander and find, oh, that looks interesting. That looks interesting. I, I'm, uh, if there was one close, you couldn't keep me away from it. I'll tell you that. One of the things that gets me, so, so I love the idea of choice. I'm actually doing a show about choice on Saturday because I think it's such a key fundamental concept. And I raised my kids around choice. We didn't take out the trash. I didn't yell at him. I said, you chose not to remember to take out the trash. It was a choice you made, right? You, it, everything's a choice. Um, have, do you do, I, I'm a big fan of job fairs where, you know, they take the gymnasium and everybody sits up a table and we have the representatives from human resources. And sometimes you've got the firemen there and the policemen there and they get to see in one glance, all of these different jobs. Is there a Kidzania version of a job fair? There are there are job fairs, and and we do them, uh, and they're done in partnership with with schools nationally and with other organisations. So so for example, I'm on the advisory board of JA Worldwide Junior Achievement. Yep. That, that that wonderful institution and JA USA, of course, is hugely successful. Yeah, sure well, is. It, it's very obvious that that Kidzania and JA do this. Yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, your solutions never lie in isolation. They always lie in partnership. So, so yep. we make these things yep. happen with, with other people. And, and, and sometimes at a very early age, because there is, I love that idea of these careers fairs and I slightly digress if I may, Mark, because I think, I think they also sometimes are part of history. So if I look at, I live in, in Sheffield in the north of England. Sheffield historically is where Sheffield steel was made. You know, the you people of Sheffield out. worked in guys. the steel industry. Well, yeah. very few of them do now because things have happened to the steel industry. And, and I think it is important as, some of, as part of these career fairs that children understand what there was and why it disappeared mm. and what replaced it. And actually, it's not that long ago. So you can still bring granddads into schools to talk about what it was like to work in the steel industry. Yeah? And I think those things are incredibly important, that understanding that things come and go and that whole areas were dependent on this. And it takes me back to that mantra of uh, children can only aspire to what they know exists. I had an office many years ago I was education director at an office at Manchester Airport. And, um, and Manchester Airport sponsored my job. It was a private uh, public uh, partnership on the, on, when Tony Blair was prime minister. And the reason Manchester Airport got involved in it is because it wanted to attract its workforce from the local community, which was, which was relatively deprived in socioeconomic terms. 
So I used to go and talk to children and say, tell me the jobs you can do at the airport. And the answer oh. I got were the things they could see. Oh, okay. Sure. Which is about 40% of the jobs at the airport. So right. you can see the bus driver, passport control, whatever it is, right? Selling newspapers. But about 60% of jobs at the airport are backstage. So instantly those children could not aspire to 60% because they didn't know that they existed. Then, because they were from a poor community, I turned around frequently and went, look, you can fly planes. And five and six-year-olds would say, people from here don't fly planes. Oh, wow. So, so when people tell me that children don't have aspirations, that's a lie. We do that for them. And the other thing is, what, what we need to do at those careers fairs, at a very young age, is not say which, which job do you choose, but simply say, have a look what there is and have a look what you don't know. Find out more, because the more you know, to go to your point, Mark, the better your choice. The better your choice, the more likely you are to move and head into the right direction. So uh, a completely different question, which I think speaks to curiosity. And I've, I, I'm going to say blessed with being insanely curious my entire life and i'm still i'm maybe even more curious now uh, than i was when i was 12 and my mother brought home the world book encyclopedia from 1925 that she'd gotten for ten dollars at a garage sale and he, she says here this is for you and i read the whole thing um i'm you know 26 volumes are kids and we hear kids are naturally curious is yeah. that true or not true yeah i think it is I, I, but i think what we need to do is we need to give them the license to be curious the so permission yes permission as in in inverted commas so so i was allowed to be curious i was allowed to be curious because because on a Saturday morning, I used to go out on my bicycle, play soccer, do whatever I wanted to do, and as long as I was home by dark, right? And, and so I was given many freedoms and many, in that sense, many responsibilities and a great deal of trust. I, I, we used to go on school visits. Your, your encyclopedia was my atlas. We used to go on school visits to Rotterdam, and I used to watch where all the, the, the big ships came in and then... Oh all the goods were loaded onto trains. And I used oh. to stand at the railway station and look where all those trains would go. And then I would go home and mark in my atlas all oh. the places I wanted to go. Mark, I wish I could find that atlas and see to how many, how many places I've been to. So, so you, you allow, you enable, you empower children to be curious. And, I, and I'm afraid we've got quite bad at that, really. Because actually, my 15-year-old daughter has got one of these. Mm. The whole world is in one of these. Yeah? And if you want to be curious, that's a very good place to start being curious. But in schools, in classrooms, we don't allow children to use them. Is that a mistake? Well, yeah, I think it's a terrible mistake. I think you build ah. up a trust relationship. You let the kids make up the rules as to how to behave and not to behave. I want to stand. I'm a language teacher by trade a German teacher, I want to stand in a classroom and say to my kids, get your phone now and start WhatsApping your friend who, who, I have, who I've organized for you in Germany whilst we're in, in Dallas or wherever we are. Why not use this instead of constantly block these, these experiences? And, and I think we're on, we're, so, so many wonderful things are happening online. So I, you mentioned Lee earlier, Lee Daly. Now, Lee's a friend of mine too. They're, they're, they're about to launch a brilliant platform called Hello Genius, which is about parental and children's learning together. It's about content, but also in a future version, it will do hybrid 2.0. It will jump between online and offline. So I'll use the simple example that, that my daughter would be watching a program about flowers narrated by David Attenborough, which is on, 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 on Hello Genius. Because she's interested in this, I would get a message. She would get a message saying, 
do remember that in Sheffield, all the parks are in bloom at the moment, and there's an app where you can find out which all the flowers are. And by the way, the David Hockney exhibition is coming to Sheffield in August, and its theme is flowered. So, so that you begin right. to jump between right. the two properly. So that what we're talking about, because it's a strange thing is we're talking about virtual reality and reality. Well, virtual reality is reality. It's just, it manifests itself differently. Right. So I think we need to kind of step back and think. And the curiosity piece sits in that. My, my very good friend, Carla Rinaldi, who's the co-founder of, of Read Your Children, probably the leading organization globally on early years learning. Her main mantra is this, we need to trust the children as much as they trust us. And I think it's a good place to start, right? Because all of a sudden we would happily hand out licenses of trust in order to empower curiosity. Why would we not do that? Gare Grouse. I knew this conversation was going to go just like that. It was Mark, earlier be before. So sorry to interrupt, my friend. We we were talking about books earlier, right? And yes, my sir. favorite my favorite book is is The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint Exupéry. Oh gosh, yes. And there is a quote in that book that says, "All grown ups were once children, yeah. but very few of them remember it." Yeah. And I think I think that would be a very good starting point when it on en route to trust. And empowerment, right? What a what a perfect way to go out. Professor, I'm just so thrilled to have you as a friend. And I think people will get some illumination from this and uh, find a way to um, possibly figure out how to get a kid Zania in their area. Uh, this show gets will, you know, live forever out there virtually. Um, and uh, we have all of, all of the notes uh, are there on the page at TEDx Santa Barbara. Please feel free to um, share that with your friends, share it with parents, share it with teachers. Uh, this is a, I, I know that you're working very, very hard on changing uh, how we think about education and our kids and learning and curiosity and trust. Gary, thank you so much for joining us on TEDx Santa Barbara. I just deeply appreciate the time you've given us. Mark, once this pandemic is over, we need to get together and uh, and have a good time. Thanks for having me today. It's been an absolute, absolute privilege. Thank you. I tell you, each week I say, could it get any better? And each week it keeps getting better. Gare is, um, is just... Uh, brilliant around kids and education. I'm so excited. Um, I will have the show up in a couple of hours. Uh, we'll send a note out. You can go and, and send it to your friends. Um, I want to let you know a couple of things that are new. Uh, one is that we are going to rebrand ourselves a little bit. Um, we are. We officially got a license yesterday to be TEDx Santa Barbara Salon. And the salon is actually the official name for what we've been doing for a year. And now we've been officially recognized by TED and TEDx for that. So uh, really excited about that. Next week, we are going to meet someone who I met two years ago at TED Fest in Brooklyn. His name is Sarb Johal. He's uh, Dr. Sarb Johal. And he's from New Zealand. He is a specialist in emergency management and disaster psychology. Bet you never heard that job description before. Turns out that he was the one of the advisors to the prime minister of New Zealand during the whole COVID crisis. And I think we all know how well New Zealand did in terms of best practices for how they address that. We're gonna to talk to him about that. He has a new book out about sleep, which is very interesting. He's a very engaging guy like we just had. So the time's going to go by just like that. So that's next week, Dr. Sarb Johal from New Zealand. This is Mark Sylvester from TEDx Santa Barbara, Making Waves, Conversations with Influencers and Disruptors. Thanking you so much for spending time with us. Be safe out there.